Manohar, I think we can go ahead and do um, the presentation mode. Okay. Will someone please say something so I can see if my... We're, we're here. Can you hear us? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll go ahead and just get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Patricia Liu, um, VP of Programs and Events for the Club of Northern California. I'm really excited for today's event. Uh, we have Manohar Shrikant, class of 2013, PhD, and uh, in course two and six. Um, it's going to tell us a little bit about uh, smartphone photography. Manohar. Oh, yeah, thank you, Pat uh, Patricia. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, have this event, and thanks for suggesting to have this event, actually. Uh, <clears throat> So I graduated in 2013, uh, course two and uh, uh, partly course six. Um, I've been in the camera space for uh, a little over, about around a decade, I would say. So basically what started as a hobby at MIT uh, turned into coursework in optics and camera systems. Then I eventually made it into a career from the last uh, seven, eight years. Uh, I spent time at Nokia camera R&D and uh, until recently for about five years at Apple camera R&D. So I have uh, some knowledge about the art of photography. You know, I always started as a digital photographer, uh, not so much into the film and such, but uh, I still have some experience with uh, the actual art of photography. Uh, but as a profession, I'm exposed to a lot of camera technologies and uh, kind of see the trend, uh, how it uh, happened over the last uh, few years. And I have a sense for you know, how it's gonna take off in the next uh, two to three years. So with that perspective, uh, I thought it would be good to give a presentation uh, to MIT crowd, which is you know, somewhat uh, receptive to technology aspects and somehow tied directly to some photographic art. You know, the, the basic uh, uh, motto is that if you know how it works, you can actually uh, kind of take advantage and uh, yeah use it for yourself uh, the way you want it. So that's the, uh, the motivation behind this presentation. So going into this uh, organization, so it's split into these four parts approximately. So part one covers the basic camera functionality or how it works and how you can actually uh, uh, take advantage of uh, the features by knowing how it works. So it some, covers some basic features. Part two, it tries to compare DSLR versus smartphone. I know there is an wide range of people who kind of have this battle between, you know, which one is better and, you know, where does each win, that sort of argument. It's, a, it's an age old, uh, you know, fight that doesn't go away. And part three focuses more on tips and tricks, you know, different uh, styles and composition and sort of more, more utility uh, side of things. And uh, based on, you know, so a lot of enthusiasm shown by the MIT uh, alum uh, organizers, I think we have this photo appreciation thing, which is about, you know, having people participate, learn and do things and submit photos and we sort of look at it. It's not a contest, but it's more of a sharing kind of a spirit. So with that, let me jump into part one. Uh, again, just to remind, each part is about 10, 12 minutes and we have five minutes of questions after each part so that, you know, people can ask questions immediately. Yeah. And if you have super yeah. burning questions, you can go ahead and ask. Yeah, if you have questions, uh, just please put it into the chat window. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. So part one. So let's look at the smartphone super basic of how things work and what happens at a very high level. And these things are the most relevant aspects. Of course, there are tons of details. Camera is made of thousands and thousands of parts and things. So let's look at uh, some of the things. So if you look at the landscape of the, the smartphone, people who have more cameras, more resolution, they are always trying to sell you every new version with new features. So camera is one of the selling points for most of the consumer 
uh, smartphone uh, devices out there. And uh, they have different things they do, do slightly different uh, aspects. And there is always this confusion, which one do I pick, you know? Uh, of course, one of the determination is which operating system you use, what are you already used to? If you are using iOS from many years, probably you might stick to the same thing. So your question would be, should I upgrade to this three camera phone or should I stay with single camera? Or if you're switching over to a different thing like an Android, then you have to do a research on whether you would like Android. Camera should not be your primary concern, but you know some people who do serious photography, that may be the concern. But having said that, one way to start digging into the camera aspects of smartphone is this website uh, called DxO Mark. Uh, it's, it's fairly mature and they rate cameras based on various aspects. You can go look it up, but generally they arrive at one holistic score. And of course, you know, you can argue one way or the other, hey, that's not right and so on and so forth. But the takeaway message is that if you look at a score which is very, very high, versus a score which is you know, 30 points off, there is a clear difference. You can actually see with your eyes, uh, you know, there is a difference. And again, if a specific aspects are important, like for example, some people care about selfie or some people care about video, uh, there may be a different score to that. So if you look into that, I think you will get some sense of where these cameras stand. And also you will kind of start to get the technical aspects behind all of these specifications, you know, so dynamic range resolution, optical quality, so on and so forth. So that's a good way, a good place to start. And there are a few other sites which does this, uh, this sort of uh, ratings and comparisons. So let me just go a little bit deeper into the camera. If you open the camera, if you take apart the phone, uh, what you see, you know, I'm taking iPhone because I come from Apple, so I'm a little more familiar with this. So if you take this, uh, this phone and repeat up, uh, you get this camera module, which is this uh, package in the center here and all the electrical connections that come out of it. So power, control of lens, everything happens through that port. And here is an X-ray through that, so you can see the, the sensor behind it. So that's just the hardware, uh, camera hardware. Of course, the, the software which runs on the processor, it's called the image signal processor, ISP, which is actually all the brains, uh, which does all the magic, most of the magic actually. So the combination of these two is what actually gives you that, that uh, beautiful images at the end of the day. So if you take a little more peep into what the camera hardware itself is, uh, as far as the photographer is concerned, uh, I mean end user, there are two things that are important, the lens and the sensor. So the sensor actually collects all the photons which comes through the, through the sensor and it records it and makes it into an actual value like bits and bytes. And there is a lens which is actually a, a, a stack of small plastic lenses, uh, sometimes glass, which goes up and down to uh, allow for the focus, basically. So if you look at the right-hand side, maybe behind one of your videos, uh, chat video videos, you can see the lens module on the top view and all the springs around it. So one thing to keep in mind, the first tip is don't bang your phone on a solid concrete or rock, because if you do, the lens can go out of alignment and the factory calibration is off, even though the company says, you know, it's, you're all fine but there is a loss in quality at the end of the day. So try to avoid shocks because the lens is not a solid state device. The lens itself is, but the mount is flexible. So there is a floating element. In fact, when you turn the phone upside down, the gravity actually pulls the lens down and they have special calibration to compensate for that. So it goes into great detail of making sure the camera works in various scenarios. So something to keep in mind. Also keep your the top surface scratch free. Once you ruin it, your, all your photos are gonna be bad from that point. So those are some things to uh, keep in mind. So let's uh, look into what happens when you pull out a phone from your pocket and you start your camera, what happens? So obviously the camera is powered up. It goes into this video mode. Constantly the frames are captured and presented to you on the screen. And every time a frame comes, the frame is analyzed. So basically what the camera does is it looks at a frame and says, oh, I'm looking at this frame, I need to adjust the focus. So that's the autofocus part of it. It tries to move the lens in and out until things are sharp. Then there is something called auto exposure, which tries to adjust the, adjust the brightness. And then the color balance, which is called the white balance and things. And then of course, there are a lot of advanced things that happen behind the, behind the under the hood. Like if there is a face, how do I beautify this face? If there's a landscape, it knows you're looking at a landscape. How do I color, you know, make the sky more bluer? Or if there's a fall color, how do I make this more rich orange? So there is an insane amount of statistics that are built up and analyzed to make your photo very beautiful. 
all of this is under the beautification filter. It's just waiting for you to click. It's, it's, you're, it hasn't take, actually saved any images. It's keep rolling and keep doing all these calculations until you hit the click button. By the way, when you press the click, uh, the shutter button, it actually saves an image few seconds before because there is a latency between the time you click and the time it actually had taken the photo and passed. So there is all these mechanisms that, uh, that keep running. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit of exposure, which I talked earlier and see how you can take advantage to get, get what you want. So as I said, when you pull your photo camera out, the first thing it sees is probably a dark image. You know, there isn't much on the screen and it says, hey, you know, my statistics says that I need to see a certain amount of brightness in all the pixels. So it increases the exposure. So increasing exposure means the time that, it, that is allowed for the sensor to record the photons. It's like a square wave pulse. So it's usually a few milliseconds uh, to a you know, few hundred milliseconds. To give you a real sense, this picture on the top frame three where the guy is standing behind, I don't know, some kind of a, a bridge or something, it's probably exposed at uh, you know, 10 or 12 milliseconds, 15 milliseconds, something of that, that order. But if you're indoor, Obviously there is less light. The camera needs to expose for longer. It takes, you know, 50, 100 milliseconds, for example. So if you don't like what the camera has decided that what is the right exposure, of course you can click on the screen and increase the exposure. There is a little long press that happens on your screen. You can increase it. When you increase it, it's called bias, biasing the, the exposure. So you can achieve the look of frame four or frame five. Uh, that is, uh, if you're wearing extremely dark shirt and if the background is very, very bright, the phone gets confused how to properly expose uh, unless the face is properly visible in the, in the view. So there is always this personal preference. So one other uh, thing to consider is if you are in wedding and you want this blue, you know, like sort of a very gloomy, beautiful, glowy look, you might want to increase the exposure so you can get that, that glowy face. Or if you want a casual picture, you can settle for whatever is in the center. So it's a, it's a choice you can make. So this is the bias. And in photography community, people use terminology called overexposure, underexposure, or bracketing, or the dynamic range, high dynamic range. They all are sort of related to the same topic. So one thing uh, I will further explain uh, in detail a bit more is the dynamic range. That refers to how much detail the camera can see in the sky in the background here. In the, in the frame three and four, it's kind of blown out, right? You don't see any detail. So that sort of is related to the dynamic range. Uh, we'll see that a little bit more uh, later. Okay, so that's the last one was the exposure. The next one is the focus, the autofocus. So the goal of this part of the camera algorithm is to drive the lens in and out until it finds something useful that is sharp. When you say something useful, it, it could be a flower or it could be a face or it could be, I don't know, some interesting thing. So in this case, uh, the, you know, frame four, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a small tiny figurine. It thinks you know, that is the sharp, sharp part and that should be what it should be in focus. Uh, but we never know, the user may want something else, in which case you have to actually click on the black uh, figurine there to force the camera to focus on that part. So this is a choice you need to make if something is not right. And if you want both of them in focus, that's usually not possible because one of the fundamental limitation of the camera is that only one plane can be in focus at any given point of time. So, you know, if you want both of them in focus, you have to get both of them in the same plane, or you have to use some specialty apps called focus stacking. What it does is it captures two different images with two different objects in focus and it tries to blend it. So, and also there is a, uh, I'll read out some of the keywords which, uh, which you might like, which is the depth of field, which is how, to what extent the object, which is out of focus, uh, is sharp or out of, uh, out of focus. So that magnification of blur is somewhat referred to as bokeh. Uh, usually for iPhone or any kind of smartphone, this is relevant to macro, where you are shooting very close by objects. Uh, we'll, we'll see that a little bit later. But for DSLR or a large lens, this is more pronounced even with uh, large objects like people and you know headshots. Okay, so anyway, if you have questions, uh, please put it on the chat window. We'll, we'll come back and uh, see those questions. So the, the other question people usually ask is, hey, what happened to the colors and what is this uh, white balance uh, thing that happens? 
So when a camera captures an image, it is stored in its internal representation of colors. And depending on the light source that was used, the color, the image could look much more warm, which is like a tungsten lit, uh, or it could look very cool if you use fluorescent light or the new uh, LED lights, which are uh, extremely cool. So that sort of is, is the, the camera functionality, which is trying to balance that image in the sense that it is trying to normalize for this existence of very extreme kinds of uh, lighting. And oftentimes it makes a mistake in doing so, and then you have to manually correct it. Again, you do it uh, within your camera menu, forcing it to, uh, to pick the kind of uh, color, cool or white, uh, or which type of balance you want. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, if you use a certain type of LED lights, which are, uh, you know, are poor in spectral content, you will get extremely bizarre uh, lighting. And that's not a camera fault, that's actually the illuminant fault or the light source uh, problem. So that's all uh, white balance. And if you look at the extreme right, uh, you can go to the extreme extent of uh, coloring individual parts of the image differently, uh, where my cursor is, sorry. So you can pick different parts of the image and change their color, that is referred to as local tone mapping. Uh, tone mapping or beautification. If there is a face, you can make it look like it has been, you have applied makeup, like you can, can make add lip color and eye gloss. And it, it, you know, the cameras, uh, some of the cameras can, apps can even change the geometry of the face. So that's sort of on the other extreme of uh, what happens, uh, what the camera does. Again, the camera never discloses that they are doing all this. They just want people to be happy. And to the extent the camera manufacturers release different versions of camera software, depending on which country you buy it. For example, uh, if the phone is sold in China, it has a certain type of beauty, beautification features uh, by default. If the phone is sold in the US, it has different kind of features. So it, it's a, it has to do with cultural uh, requirements and you know, desires uh, from that region. Something to keep in mind. Um, okay. So one uh, thing related to this, uh, this uh, white balance that came up recently is there was fire, wildfire, and the sky was looking orange, and people tried to take these pictures, and different people got different results, and there was a lot of articles online uh, trying to fight to, you know, why did the camera ruin my picture? The, one of the fundamental problems is the camera is not a truthful device. It's tried to be faithful, but not truthful. So it doesn't know what actually colors are. It tries to balance it out. So if you look at uh, some of the articles that I've put here, maybe you can go uh, to those links later on. So there is a lot of debate on what is the right, uh, right thing to do and why it failed. And it has to do with this white balance functionality. And it takes a, a picture which is very orange and it can make it into less orange. Or sometimes it can make even more orange. I've seen pictures online which are extremely like, you know, like uh, that movie, uh, I forget the movie, The Blade Runner, I think. They, they kind of make it a very uh, apocalyptic type. Uh, maybe it was, I don't know. But uh, so I wanted to find out what, what really is, is going on. So I had this little spectrometer with me. So I pointed the spectrometer at the sky and looked at the actual wavelengths of light coming out. So this is uh, the actual final reality. That's the actual color. What the camera does is actually subsample the spectrum and represent it in three RGB values. And when you do that and try to balance the image, you lose that sense of realism. Uh, again, it's beyond the, the aspect of this, uh, this presentation, but uh, it has to do with the color perception, the human adaptation to various uh, 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 exposed colors and how the images are viewed on the laptop and calibration, so on and so forth. But just want to leave a thought there that, you know, it's all an illusion, what you see as an RGB. So uh, when you say it is truthful, you have to actually look under a bit more scientifically. So this sort of... Uh, uh, I think concludes part one. Uh, I think we are uh, good on time. So yep. uh, we can open up for some questions. Manohar, there's quite a few questions that came in. Bob asked, how can you tell if lens calibration has been affected by day-to-day -day handling? Uh, it is very, very hard. So it depends on the manufacturer of the phone and specific uh, versions of the phone. Let me go there uh, a little bit uh, to the lens. So. The, one of the reasons why you use calibration is because some phones have this multi-camera system. So what they do is they use two cameras to look at the same scene and they try to register with each other. 
uh, they want to match the same objects in each other so they can reduce the depth. So the algorithms rely on very precise uh, calibration. If you are not able to get the kind of uh, portrait bokeh or sort of the depth coverage uh, on the feature, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, further down the slide. If that is not working properly, that is an indication that the calibration is lost. And some manufacturers actually do dynamic calibration. Even if you hit the phone, you know, not very hard, but to some, some extent it's damaged. It can update the calibration uh, by looking at the scene. There is a closed loop calibration, but oftentimes you go beyond repair. So the, in which case uh, it's hard to know. And by the way, it's very hard to know whether you're broken out uh, unless you have access to the internal firmware and things like that. You know, uh, company wouldn't want you to know because then they'll be liable to change it, I guess. <laughs> so there is that, yeah. Romero asked, why is the lens suspended rather than mounted in a fixed position? Okay, so that's a good question. So uh, let me go to this focus. So the way you achieve focus is by moving the lens in and out, right? It, it has to be in some sort of a barrel uh, that should be able to go in and out. And I showed a picture earlier. So uh, olden days, olden days when I mean few years ago, it, there used to be a mechanism called voice coil. So it's like a speaker, your traditional home speaker. So there is a magnet and a voice coil which pushes it in and out. Uh, so you need to move the lens to achieve focus. So I have some diagrams later, maybe it will become clear why you need to move the lens. It's, the, it's the, those lens equation, the basic uh, physics of how an image is formed. One over F equal to one over, you know, S1 plus S2. And what is the meaning of film speed in a digital camera? Okay, okay, great, great question. So um, let me answer it uh, as uh, sim uh, in the simplest form. Uh, there are some details further down, but at the end of the day, uh, a sensor produce, collects the photons. Uh, this sensor collects the photons. There are pixels under, inside this uh, big sensor. There are thousands of millions of pixels and they collect photon and the photons are converted into electrons and the electron charge like a capacitor is converted into uh, a digital value, like a voltage. So ISO speed kind of refers to amplification of that signal. There is no such thing as ISO in digital. It's all kind of a relic and it match, It is simply matched to the, some old film standard. Uh, so that's when you say higher and higher ISO, what that means is that that analog value is amplified using an amplifier. And that refers to, they kind of uh, relate it to the, the ISO of, or the film speed. Uh, I don't know if you if I answered that uh, properly. So there are two types of amplifi uh, amplification. The electrons char uh, charge that comes out of the capacitor uh, is amplified using you know analog amplifier. That's one type of amplification. Second is digital. It's just mathematical multiplication. Uh, so it just you, you, instead of phone, you might as well take those numbers and multiply. It, 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 there is not much there to it. So a combination of these two, they equate it to traditional film ISO in some reference frame, frame of reference. Uh, there are some standards associated with it. I see. Thank you, Manohara. I think those are all the questions for now. There's some that uh, we'll ask um, when we get to those sections. Okay, yeah, sounds, sounds good. Okay, so moving on. So now uh, we to move to section part two. Uh, this is, uh, I, I intended it to be a little more technical than the past one, uh, uh, but at the same time, the goal is to take away some of the photographic uh, uh, tips and uh, tricks that you can based on the technical understanding. So that's the spirit. Uh, okay, so let's just, for, you know, again, this is a address, trying to address the battle of DSLR and smartphone. So if you look at the DSLR, you know, it's heavy, you have to carry it, you know, it's a, you have to pay for it. Uh, after capturing images, you have to download it. You need a computer. So it's, it's not uh, that straightforward. So it, it involves a certain amount of dedication. So it has its space. And on the right-hand side, you have smartphone. And clearly smartphones have their own niche. You know, you can put it in your pocket. It's there always. You can take selfies. You know, it's hard to take selfie with a DSLR. You know, you cannot hold that uh, jumbo thing in your hand. Uh, it, it's very social and you can, Click, it, click an image and share it immediately, right? So each have their own uh, territories. Uh, but then again, there is always a debate, uh, which one should I buy or uh, what should I do if I want higher quality images? 
by the way when i say dslr you can include all pocket cameras or micro four thirds or any of those contraptions uh, uh people people can buy uh, out there so if you look at the gap between the dslr and the cell phone uh, it has shrunk quite a bit uh because the the smartphone companies always wanted to reach the quality of the dslr that was always the reference and they kind of asymptotically reached that that uh, that that point and it's it's quite hard to now distinguish the quality between the two so i've shown uh, some example again this these examples are from dxo website uh, there are like interesting articles there on the left is a pixel 3 camera uh, with an image night shot and the right is a sony a7r that probably costs i know 1200 dollars or 1500 dollars if you include the lens that probably costs uh, 2000 dollars so you have a 2000 dollar for camera and on the left hand side a pixel 4 by the way the phone costs probably 500 dollars the actual camera module is only 100 bucks just just round it to that so they both can produce same type of image in often times you know cell phones can produce even better you know so there is uh, you know there is that uh, that issue so they both are very very uh, tightly competing uh, in this case and if you look at the trajectory of the cell phone itself you know from 2013 i'm referring to the bottom uh, image row of image so even the cell phone by its own right has improved quite a bit uh from 2013 if you look at the 2019 uh, it, these are all test images taken in dark conditions so the final way to look at this in my opinion uh, is the following so you can have uh, this is sort of a venn diagram by the way although it's not a circle it's sort of become rectangleish so you have the cell phone's territory which has its in its own right it's great and you have the dslr territory which is on the right hand side and there is this middle region where cell phone and dslr are you know in tight race they do almost the same thing and roughly speaking these are the phones which have higher scores in the dxo mark greater than 100 and the dslr which is you know typically not so expensive like 1200 or 1500 range so if you take these these kind of gadgets they they are very similar so the tip is if you are in that region don't try arguing with uh, the guy with a good cell phone uh, if you have a dslr because you're probably going to you know humiliate yourself or you know you may have your part of your brain thinking about the guilt of spending all that so so if you want to fight with a smartphone photographer you have to be on the extreme right yeah either you use a dslr properly to capture images where you can differentiate uh or uh, uh, you know uh, be in the middle and not not show up you know you can be in your own world so that's something to keep in mind so i want to take a little more deeper dive uh, on this and go technically just to tell you why smartphones excel uh here we go so to give you a comparison here is a dslr lens and the red block is sort of a sensor inside let's assume that's the dslr and what you see here on my cursor that is actually the cell phone camera module so that 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 size versus this size so that's the difference so here is a dslr lens right and uh, the uh, cell phone lens so dslr is using a lot of resources it's very heavy and uh, you know obviously uh, you you expect it to do more uh, and if you look at the sensor the dslr sensor is very huge so what you see here my cursor the green area blue green area is the actual size of the sensor in scale comparison to the the uh, the iphone or the any of the mobile phones so even the sensor is bigger and the lens is bigger so if you look at the the sensor part so the bigger the sensor it can collect more photons and it has a higher capacity to collect the photons the well capacity so it comes to around 14x the dynamic range it's not 14% it's not uh, you know uh, 400% it's like 14x that's a huge number and when you say dynamic range just for people to be on the same page it allows you to capture i'm seeing uh, putting my cursor here on the top uh, top right so the sky has so much more light so if the sensor needs to have the capacity to record the dark shades all the way to the very bright uh, shades so a higher dynamic range camera can do that and snr refers to signal to noise ratio higher the number your images are less noisy or more more cleaner so clearly dslr wins you know absolutely takes the takes the trophy home in this regard and if you look at the lens alone not the sensor just the lens even there the dslr wins 
So people usually refer to this F number of the, the camera, which is which when you say iPhone has F1.8 and you have a DSLR with F1.8 lens, they are actually not the same lens. Uh, although there is a conception, I wouldn't say it's a misconception. There is some uh, uh, terminology that if you have same F number, you collect the same amount of light, but that is only true in, in a certain sense when you're comparing lenses within a camera system, not from cam camera to cam uh, different camera system. So in fact, if I take the same iPhone kind of lens and equate it to a DSLR, you indeed get 40 times more output because the lens area is 40 times more in this example, in this uh, toy example. So uh, the, the, in the light that the lens intercepts is much, uh, much larger. So you get more uh, light throughput. So the, uh, the, the clearly the lens wins. So here is the final comparison. So the lens is a win, the sensor is a win, low noise, high dynamic range. But if you compare DSLR and the smartphone, the smartphone still wins in certain uh, uh, wide use case. The reason for that, one of the reasons for the reasons for that is that a smartphone uses something called a multi-frame processing. So what it does is when I, I said in the beginning that when you pull out your phone, it's in this video recording or live feed more. As the frame comes, uh, keeps on coming and rolling in, it's not just that it is using one single frame. The frame that is presented to you oftentimes borrows information from multiple uh, frames. Uh, for instance, some frames could have lower exposure, some frames could have higher exposure, so it optimally combines information from different frames to produce a more, more useful uh, final image. Whereas the DSLR as it stands today is mostly a single frame processing. Like you hold it, capture it, and you're done. So because of that, and, uh, and in addition to that, when a company like Apple or Samsung or uh, uh, Huawei, whomsoever makes it, makes the camera, they optimize the software and hardware in, in a such a tightly integrated manner that it's, it, it's very tightly, uh, how do I say, uh, uh, vertical stacking is very tightly done. Whereas in DSLR, you buy a body from somewhere, you buy lens from somewhere, it's very hard for the manufacturers to do that sort of, uh, that level of optimization. So that's actually one of the fundamental reasons. Maybe there are others I'm, I might not be looking at, but I'm open for suggestion, but this is uh, one of the main reasons why the, the smartphones uh, still come out ahead. Okay, so this is slightly changing uh, uh, topic. Um, again, in the same line of thought. So there's a new feature, not super new, but it's been there for a few years. One of the reasons people used a large DSLR lens was to get this thing called bokeh. Uh, what that means is that uh, on the left-hand side, you have an image and you have a subject and you can make this background very blurry. So the idea is that, you know, the foreground is very sharp and the background is blurred. So there is this nice separation. Aesthetically, it's very nice. And, uh, the cell phone companies wanted to do the same kind of thing uh, in the DSLR, uh, sorry, in their smartphone. But obviously because of the physics, because the lens is so tiny, you, you cannot get that. But they, they try, try to do it in an in a artificial, artificial way. So when you use that feature, maybe a lot of you may be already using this feature. One thing to keep in mind is that if you take a very wide angle picture, uh, wide angle, so there are multiple lenses in your uh, smartphone, let's say, if you use a wide angle lens, you have to get really close and you distort the face and everything is in sharp, sharp focus. And if you use a tele lens, you kind of step back a little, the face looks a little less undistorted, but you have very little bokeh, like very small amount of blur on the background. It's hardly noticeable. But what the smartphone does is it figures out the foreground and background in, and it artificially blurs it. But the key thing to keep here, uh, keep in mind is that this kind of uh, feature works well if you have a well-defined boundary. Like this guy has a hair which kind of sits on his head. There is no nothing that is standing out, uh, poking out. So if you have a scenario like that, that works well. And if you do not have something like that, I'll show an example, it, it fails. Uh, so if you plan to use it on your LinkedIn or some sort of, a, I don't know, portfolio picture, you have to keep in mind the limitations of uh, that feature. So here is an example. So you have to mind the edges. So this guy is wearing a glass and the edge of the glass uh, is blurred out and the software thinks that it is part of the background and it, and it completely got blurred out. By the way, the way it works is that 
uh, this again goes back to this calibration issue. So the phone uses two cameras and it looks at the scene with slightly different perspective and tries to deduce how, how far each pixel is, uh, how, how far each point in the scene is. And it tries to say, okay, this is my foreground. This is my background. I'm going to take cut, cut these two separate up and then I blur the background and add them together back. So I have an experiment in the center here with this uh, toy and it has this fine hair. And if you look at the hair, the software actually gave it a free haircut. So this is something to keep in mind. If people have features like this, like an earring or fuzzy hair, so it kind of makes it uh, into this ugly thing. But if you had a real DSLR with an actual uh, bigger lens, it can make this very pristine, uh, actual physically correct uh, blur. Uh, so that's something to you have to keep in mind. Where where are its failure modes so that you're you're thoughtful in either picking the subjects correctly or uh, to get, get your expectations uh, right. And just to dive a little more deeper, and this goes back to previous question, why uh, the focusing, why do you need to move the lens? Uh, so basically here is a lens, that green thing in the center, and these are the cone of uh, light from a single point. And all, of, all that cone comes back to focus uh, on this blue sensor here. And that corresponds to the sharp hair uh, of uh, here of the toy. And anything further behind, the, the example I'm showing here, it comes to focus much before the sensor and it spreads out again and it then comes to the sensor. So what you record is this fuzzy, fuzzed out, blurred out background basically. This corresponds to this region. And when you have a, a, an iPhone or any, any uh, cell phone, you're basically that effect is so less that you can hardly notice the, the equivalent. In fact, just to give you a tidbit, uh, back in the days, even before you know 1960s, people actually considered blur, background blur to be sort of undesirable. They didn't want it. They actually wanted through and through sharp images. So they took a big, uh, you know, for full format camera and they closed down the aperture to get a uh, very, very shallow or very sharp image overall. But uh, now the cell phones can do it for free. And if, you're, if you want to know the real numbers, the actual equivalent depth of field for a cell phone number, the kind of lens in DSLR is F150. That's the amount of aperture you need to close in order to get this. So you can actually take advantage of this. There is some examples I show later. So there is something called forced perspective. Everything is in sharp focus. So you can create interesting uh, uh, things with that. Um, I hope uh, it was uh, uh, you know somewhat uh, clear. It's, it's a, Tough topic to explain in one slide. Uh, I will briefly explain. So usually people think of bokeh as the only outcome of having a large aperture, but even the foreground looks different because if you look at this uh, cell phone cone and the cone of the, the DSLR, this, the, the cone angle is much larger. So you're covering a larger cone versus much smaller cone and the reflections are at a different distance. So if I, I'm showing you two examples here. So the reflections on this, this object blurs out because reflections are at a different distance. It's a virtual difference, uh, distance, right? So you get this bonus benefit of making even the foreground nicer. So if you take a picture portrait with a very large DSLR lens, even the foreground looks much nicer because of this, uh, this sort of uh, aspect. Uh, people usually don't talk about this, but that happens in, in reality. Um, one way to, if you have, if you're forced to use a cell phone sensor, a cell phone camera to get such a nice clean looking image. So you have to either make the reflections more smooth in the sense that you be in a room where the walls and doors and windows, everything is kind of uh, covered. So you have a smooth background. So you don't see the sharp, sharp transitions. So that's actually another segue to uh, justifying having a softbox because this is a light which has an extended area and it kind of gives you that pleasing look um, in addition to, of course, making the uh, shadows uh, soft. Again, so this is a bit uh, too too deep, but let's uh, let's uh, stop there and uh, take, take any questions uh, on this topic. Yes, so Manohar Dylan asked, um, would using ND filters on a smartphone camera in increase the dynamic range? Short answer is no, because uh, uh, if you if you took 
actually in effect uh, it's probably not helping you too much it may help in certain corner scenarios i can explain that but the dynamic range is dictated by the sensor physical sensor the size and the the cmos uh, uh, technology that they have used and uh, the the lens and not the lens but actually the sensor a uh, little bit on the micro lens on the sensor but uh, it doesn't help but in certain scenarios where you are so bright that the uh, if there are no other questions so not too many other i can take a bit more time to explain this a little bit okay um i'll just tell you the other two uh -huh. other two questions one is does clip on lens on cell phone work and the other okay. one is from rebecca are there no dslr cameras that do multi frame processing and if so why yeah okay good good so let me finish this uh, dynamic range uh, question so if you put an nd filter you can think of it as reducing the entire light in your in your space that's equivalent to just changing the scene uh, so the intrinsic property of the camera doesn't change on certain rare occasions it can so happen that your scene is so bright the exposure that the camera needs is of the order of let's say 1 microsecond and the hardware is physically incapable of doing such short exposures in that case introducing an nd filter could help you uh get back get the camera back into a range in its operating range uh otherwise not and often times people use something called graduated nd filters so it's a piece of glass with half of the top is dark and the other half is clear so if you're taking a landscape uh, picture the sky is usually bright so you hold it up such that the darker part covers the sky and the sun and the clear part is on the on the rest of the the landscape uh they you can actually help uh, boost artificially some of the i, I wouldn't say dynamic range but it, it helps you capture the scene reduce the scene scene's dynamic range let's put it that way okay so that is that and the second question was does uh, clip on uh, work the clip on does a clip on lens on cell phones work yeah so that uh, i have some slide uh, let me jump and come back uh, it is okay so oh there we go yeah so the the tricky part is yes they do work in the sense work what they are you know what you are paying for you get something out of it but usually you know not not amazingly well so one of the cases is if you want extremely telephoto uh, framing like you want to zoom into the scene quite a bit maybe you can uh, buy one of the sophisticated lenses and uh, uh, clip clip it on and you can narrow it down but one thing to keep in mind is that you cannot hand hold it because if you are so narrow tele, uh, so narrow in your field of view even small hand mo motion will shift your scene quite a bit so you you probably need to use a tripod and the second uh, use case for clip on lenses is uh, this 360 extremely wide field of view lenses uh yes those are also fun because you can capture the entire you know, if you are on a boat you can capture everybody including you uh, if you had an extremely wide angle lens so they do work in the sense work depending on which manufacturer you buy and what level of uh, optical design and you know pro, uh, quality they have uh, yeah, uh, done it on it uh so and there's uh, another question for autofocus does uh, image processing randomly guess which way to go or is there a signal in the aberrations that help the autofocus mechanism yeah. determine so whether the desired focal plane is near or farther Yeah so that's a great question so uh so many sensors i'm just try trying to generalize it uh generally if you just normally use uh, a bare sensor with no special features uh, like a phase detector and things like that it's very hard to know which way to move until unless you have some statistics about uh, how things change when you move the focus so many of the smartphone cameras use something called phase detect pixels so they they get this phase difference between two different views so that actually can directly at least in some vicinity can tell you how much you need to move the lens in order to uh, get sharp, a certain feature sharp so either you go like a, i don't know the old the newton newton's optimization where you take individual fixed steps towards your optimization and you arrive at local minima or you can use a gradient strength of the gradient to you know uh, go to your optimal point faster so some of these sensors use phase detect to know uh, the uh, the sort of error in which way how much you need to adjust to move the lens 
Another thing is in DSLRs, there is an actual phase, uh, a separate focusing mechanism that's even more faster uh, in, in knowing which way to drive the lens uh, to move, uh, to get the focus. And then um, one of the last questions in the section, are there DSLR cameras that do multi-frame processing? Uh, most of them don't. You have to force it to do it. In DSLR, there is this concept of uh, bracketing. So what you do is you, uh, when you take a picture, you ask the phone to take uh, four or five additional images where you underexpose a few images and overexpose a few images with certain, certain compensation. And the assumption is that later on when you take it to your computer, you know which ones are those images, you group them together, and it's like a, you have to manage it. You have to remember it and manage it. And maybe some, some phones, uh, some uh, DSLRs automate this, but the, the most I have used the Canon and Nikon generally leave it to the photographers to use it. Actually, going back to the topic, uh, in general, the DSLR is highly underutilized. So you are responsible for, for uh, you know, to, to utilize it as, as best as you can. Okay, thank you. Cool. Okay, so sounds good. So if that is all, uh, I think we are good, good, good on time. So this section is a little more about leaving all the techniques behind and sort of uh, fiddling with the camera uh, as a starting point. Uh, you know, many, at least me, many of, uh, times I ha have this mental block. You know, if I don't know anything, I'm like, oh, what do I do next? So sort of wanted to create this uh, inspiration. Thanks to Patricia who wanted me to do this, uh, do this properly. So if you're, some guidelines for composition. Again, this is a very vast topic and, you know, no opinion is perfectly correct, but just general rule of thumb for, for certain group of people who want to get started. So if you're composing a portrait, you have to keep in mind how different focal lengths are the tele versus wide give you different types of uh, images. For example, the top left image, the guy looks, uh, you know, different in different images. And actually in my experiences, uh, my experience, some people look good in wide and some people look uh, uh, good in tele. So you have to experiment and see. Usually it happens, as, uh, happens that people who are on the plus side in a largish frame, they kind of look slimmer in the wide angle. And people who are uh, kind of uh, more slimmer, they look better in the tele. Generally, it's my, my uh, feeling, but there are some internet articles about it. And uh, if you go away from face and focus on the whole body, you have to make sure that you're not distorting the person. So if you take a wide angle camera and go closer to the head, obviously the head looks larger uh, in relation to the, the legs. Uh, you see the right top right image. Yeah. So you have to keep in mind some of those things. And on the bottom left, uh, this is one of the uh, MIT alums who works at Google. I took uh, this image from his paper. So if you take a selfie with extremely wide angle, on the left you see all, you know, People who are on the extreme corner, their faces are all oblong and distorted. It looks uh, really bizarre. Uh, so he has a paper on how to fix it and maybe it will come in the future or maybe it's there, I don't know. But you, through software, you can somewhat fix it, but still your hand is uh, super distorted. So you have to keep in mind some of those effects uh, when you compose, compose your, uh, your picture. Uh, try to keep everybody slightly away and in the same plane, then you're okay. But if some people are very close and they are in the corner, that's where you get this, this sort of uh, weird distortions. Um, something you can try is uh, even some of the apps on the four devices allows it. They put these grid lines. And for example, you can uh, go do landscape and keep your main subject on one of the grid lines. It's called uh, rule of thirds. Uh, you can use it to get somewhat pleasing images. So I have enough space on the top, enough space on the bottom the landscape kind of coincides, the edge of the landscape, your, your land versus sky kind of coincides the bottom horizontal line. Your main subject is either on the right or on the left. So you can use this principle kind of in a, in a rule of thumb way and kind of get uh, uh, better results. And then once you get this uh, going, you can actually change this and do whatever you like. And on the internet, uh, there are people who kind of break down images into, oh, you know, this is why this photograph is great because it has this spiral and it's kind of funny to me, but you know, I don't know. Uh, that's something to have that in mind. So Manohar, there was an earlier question about this as well with the golden ratio, what are your thoughts about using that? Yeah, I, I have no thoughts, I, I have no comments. 
<laughs> it, it's more of a, I would say that's where my artistic uh, sense uh, stops. I would use golden ratio if I'm design. I don't know, designing an entry door for a house or something. But in a picture, uh, I don't know how how that all comes together. It's a little bit beyond me. Yeah. Uh, some other interesting things, and this is mostly possible with cell phone, and it's a lot of fun because you can your cell phone is so small and your camera is at pretty much at the the end of your phone you can get very close to certain subjects and again uh, one of the key feature is extended very uh, narrow depth of field uh, sorry not narrow the, the, uh, the open range of depth of field where everything is in kind of sharp focus you can use it to your advantage uh, for example this guy what he's doing is he has taken a glass uh, cu you know a cup empty glass cup and put his phone inside and Submerge the cup, cup halfway into the into the water, so you can get this uh, sort of oceanographic, you know, underwater photography type of thing of the dog there. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool, and you can get these reflections where you can take your phone very close to a puddle of water, and you can see the reflection of your skyline or whatever it is, and you can lay your phone on, on the ground flat, maybe on a on a piece of napkin or paper towel, and get these interesting perspectives. So, you know, by far, I, in my opinion, point of view is your biggest degree of freedom you can control in photography. That is especially true if you have a wide angle lens because a small change in your position completely changes how the, how the image turns out to be. Here, uh, somebody standing far in front with a shoe and a bunch of guys in the back, and you can create this sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, Lilliput, uh, that sort of, uh, uh, you know, small creature experience there. And there is something like tilt shift. I didn't put an example here where you can blur half the top and half the bottom, leaving some sharp parts in between. Yeah, that also create this miniature look. You know, without actually investing in hardware or buying stuff, you can have a lot of fun. So there is that opportunity because it's already there with you. Uh, it creates interesting images. Uh, some people use phone as a reflection device to create this, this interesting artifact. I mean, instead of using DSLR, you can tune, use another phone or use a, use a plastic, uh, you know, some sort of a plastic sheet, which is reflective to create this sort of uh, interesting effects. And if you're into capturing, you know, more slightly more professional, you can either take a paper and create your own studio at home, uh, get a little tripod, or if you don't want to do that, people clue to, together some sort of uh, paper clips or duct tape or whatever. And, you know, you can take food photograph. One thing to make sure is that when you, do all this sort of photography, light is very important and you have to use broadband light. Generally, that's that's best thing to do. When I say broadband, that means it's spectrally rich. Uh, many of these fluorescent light and many of the cheap LEDs are very spiky in the sense that, uh, say, I'll give you an example because we have, we have some time. So most LEDs produce red, blue, and green light individually and they kind of... Uh, smooth the spectrum by adding some layer of phosphor and uh, other re-emitters. So what happens is because they're producing a very narrow wavelength of red, if the camera sensors red wave sensitivity is outside the red of your LED, then that color is basically lost. It, it sees it as black. Uh, so you have to pick your light source, which is set of broad spectrum. The cheapest broad spectrum light is the uh, sunlight. It, it is about most uh, rich, rich in wavelengths and gives you very nice images. And another thing you want to make sure when you're shooting from the top is that not to cast the shadow of your own phone and hands on, on your food. Uh, try, try to avoid that, have lights which are larger. Or if you have a point, you know, a spotlight, try to shine it on the ceiling, uh, which is supposedly it should be white ceiling. Then it will act like a reflector, putting back a more uniform large light. And also try to avoid very dark and very bright uh, objects in the scene. For example, in the shoe case, uh, in the shoe here, the shoe part is very, uh, you know, dark and the background or the in interior is very bright. The scene may be a lot more, has a lot more dynamic range uh, than your phone, then the images may not come out fine. So either you use apps which allow for high dynamic range or uh, you pick a different camera which has a larger dynamic range. So you have to think through uh, what your scene is. Another thing you can do is uh, slow shutter speed where you keep your phone still, possibly using a tripod and sort of get these uh, trails of light. Uh, so you need some specialized apps, uh, maybe some are paid and some are free. Uh, you know, we have to explore for different Google, Android and iPhone. 
uh, you can create this interesting stream of water where the water is all blurred out and everything else is kind of in sharp. And you can have some subjects which are still and everybody around kind of in this moving kind of create this uh, unusual surreal pictures. Uh, then obviously this light painting. So what's happening is that the phone is still, the subject is still, somebody takes a light source and kind of moves it around in the scene randomly or maybe in certain shape. So because you are exposing for a longer period of time, that sort of creates this, uh, this streak and you can create these interesting effects. And what is happening here uh, in this colorful image is that I think they're using color filters from point one, moving to a different point and point and changing the color filter on the light. So it creates this unusual mix of colors. So this is all the things you can do with stuff that you can find around your home, uh, potentially. If you live in a home with color filters, <laughs> that I mean. Um, so there are some apps which allow you to capture raw images. Uh, uh, the, the fundamental advantage is that the raw has a bit more information. And of course you can do the higher dynamic range with that. But again, you fall into this curse of, uh, again, you know, dynamic, uh, the DSLR where you are responsible for making the images very nice now. Because all the beauty stuff and all the smart things that the phone does internally is more kind of uh, packaged in the native app or some of the standard camera apps. So if you happen to use RAW plus, you know, some HDR features, maybe you need, you need to use another software which edits or takes that image and kind of makes it nice, you know, uh, helps you edit the image or maybe that same app has features to make the image look nice. So that's something to keep in mind. And there are like tons of email, uh, apps out there. So fundamentally, when you say raw capture, what it does is it controls the shutter speed, which I explained in the very beginning, the, the time, uh, the, the pulse, the millisecond, it co uh, controls the amplification or the ISO gain. Uh, and controls the flash power. These are the main things that it controls. There is, and, and obviously the lens, the, in, uh, the movement of the lens. There is not much else to control, control in, a, in a camera uh, at the end of the day. Everything else is sort of a bells and whistles or minor, minor uh, uh, aspects uh, to it. So all these software that they advertise, okay, you know, I can do this, I can do that. At the end of the day, they are all controlling uh, three or four key parameters. But the nice thing or the differentiating part is how nice the user interface is, how simple things are to, to, for you to learn and use and uh, so on and so forth. So that's about apps. Uh, I have put a list here, but there are, you know, you know internet is full of them. Um, when it comes to accessories, there are a few and some people uh, like taking more selfies. And for that, there are apps which are more towards, you know, this light ring, uh, you know, which gives you a more uniform light. One thing to keep in mind is that the worst place to put a light source in a, in a, in a photographic system is right next to the camera. And most of the cell phones put light sources right next to the, ca the camera. So like pretty much all of them, that is the worst place to put it. I mean, it's an engineering decision. It, it is sort of, uh, if you put a light source somewhere else, it looks awkward and aesthetics, all those uh, things play a role. But uh, if you want the most ugliest images, you use the, uh, the flash which is on board. And here is an example uh, of a flash image. It looks very you know, unflattering. If you use a ring light, still no close to the camera, but it, its area uh, size is larger, the actual extent is larger. It, it tends to reduce the shadows and make it uh, more smoother. Uh, again, for the benefit of the phone companies, if the light has to be pointy and tiny, uh, I, I presumably the closer, the best place is close to the camera, but that, uh, that is not a good thing to do in general. Um, uh, having said, okay, there, so that's about the light. So investing in, in one of these lights, uh, maybe even good for zoom calls. If you are doing a zoom call, this thing actually goes on the laptop or many other places kind of gives you a nice, uh, nice look. Um, and uh, somebody asked about the lenses. There is a whole zoo of lenses available doing different things and claiming different things. Uh, the only annoying thing about it is that it's an extra thing to keep in the pocket and carry it around, take it out, maintain it, uh, which is uh, somewhat annoying. Uh, the phone itself has a certain amount of zoom. Uh, one thing you can try is take a picture and manually zoom it, like, you know, digitally zoom it, and then compare your digital zoom to the actual lens zoom. So you'll see whether actually it is doing any, any different because you're optically limited. 
Anytime you add an extra lens on top and passing through another relay uh, lens behind it, the optically it's, it, it's not, you are not gonna get the best performance. So that, that is that. And one interesting uh, toy or a tool that, you know, it, it's great is this called gimbal uh, or gimbal shown here. So as you hold it for videography, it kind of stabilizes it uh, irrespective of how you move your hand. Uh, so that's a gimbal and uh, it used to be pretty expensive until recently. And uh, now on Amazon, I think they are less sub hundred dollars. So it has a tripod to hold it straight. It has a gimbal attached and it also has a selfie stick, you know. Uh, so it's, it's probably is a yeah, useful thing to, to get uh, something like that. So Manohar, we, we have quite a few questions that came in, but in the interest of time, do you want to do uh, talk about the photo appreciation real quick and then um, Manohar is gracious enough to stick around for a few minutes after six so um, we can answer all the questions about the techniques and accessories after yeah. uh, just a quick note about the appreciation. Yeah, cool. So, uh, so I'll run through the appreciation part and then we'll come back to the questions. So the idea here is, you know, uh, you look at all these techniques, you probably, I'll share this slide deck, uh, you can, uh, uh, you ask, listed some techniques you can try. So the idea is to not have a contest or not have the pressure of making amazing things, but the spirit is to share. And in the process of sharing, at least try to make an effort to make things nice in, in terms of photography quality. So uh, try to experiment and explore different things and share, share with, with, a, with the group. And you can add a note when you share, trying to say, uh, trying to ask for feedback, you know, how it could be better or uh, what something you tried and, you know, uh, before and ha after how it came out, some sort of uh, insight that you found uh, or some new technique you found, you can share you know, with the actual text uh, content. And you can ask for feedback, you know, somebody can critique on composition or a few other aspects. So we have uh, quite a few photographers in our community here in MIT alum. So, uh, I know Scott, uh, uh, who is probably in the audience, uh, probably will give some feedback. So and curate, uh, not curate, but uh, uh, add feedback. So on uh, how to submit, I think I let Patricia explain a little bit about how to submit this. Yes. So um, if you're, you can submit it through our various social media um, on Facebook through the MIT CNC group and just post it in the Facebook group with the hashtag MIT CNC underscore uh, phone photo. And you can also post it on your um, Twitter or Instagram with the same hashtag and then um, we'll get, get your photo that way. And uh, Manohar will provide some feedback on your photo. Uh, uh, yeah, me, maybe a few other photographers, uh, Scott and uh, whomsoever we have it, you know, we have on the team. So I'll give some inspiration for you guys because this slide will be shared. Uh, uh, actually, I didn't put any pictures to explain what those are. So landscape, slow shutter, light painting, before, after. What I mean by that is you casually take a picture and then you apply some technique and, uh, you know, you probably presumably... Uh, uh, got a better picture and you, it's good to see before and after because if you just show after, people don't know what happened. So if you show, you know, you can appreciate the delta and whether the, the whole thing was worth it, by the way. Uh, you can try black and white reflections just below the water. Remember when you put your phone below the water, try not to wet it, uh, you know, uh, you can ruin your phone <laughs> if the water goes in, especially salt water. Uh, try not to do it in, in near the ocean because, you know, even a bit of salt can corrode the inner uh, interior. Uh, selfie challenge, you know, don't shy away from taking a selfie. Uh, try to take a studio quality selfie if you can, uh, as uh, with as nice a look as, as possible. Uh, you can try macro, uh, still life. Still life usually is like a table with a bunch of fruits and berries and that sort of thing. But the nice, the, 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 the cool thing to achieve here is to kind of make it look like an artistic painting uh, without actually editing the picture, but purely by photographic means Try to make it look uh, a bit more like a like a art art uh, paint. Mood is where you have a subject, either yourself or somebody, uh, to have a specific desired mood. You know, uh, there's rain outside and somebody sitting next to window. Maybe there is no rain here uh, in the next few weeks, but uh, giving an example. Action is more like uh, jumping, uh, somebody jumping or water splashing. 
a uh, lot of the cool things people try is uh, exploding a water balloon on the head. The most difficult part is to click the shutter button right when the balloon explodes. It's not so easy because it's either after or before. And every time you experiment, you have to you know redo yourself, uh, dry dry your hair and whatnot. So it's it's a tough challenge. So so that's that's uh, that's the entire presentation. So now we can have sort of an open discussion from now on. Yes. So Manohar, uh, for the adjustments that you mentioned, are there adjustments you can make after taking the picture, or is there is there something you need to do with the long push? Uh, is it uh, in general? You're asking the uh, so that's in general, right? After taking the picture. So that's one of the things about the iPhone. Uh, let me go back to a, a relevant slide. Yeah. So the what the way the cell phone the cell phone camera does is it exploits everything it is possibly can to generate one beautiful image. What that also means is that there is very little room at the end to manipulate that image in terms of contrast or saturation and things like that. You can, but it sort of is limited. But in the DSLR case, you have a huge headroom left for any sort of post-processing. You can brighten the image, darken the image. You can change uh, color contrast uh, uh, quite a bit. So that's something to keep in mind critically because when you shoot with DSLR, you, there may be a scene, you, you don't have enough time to adjust everything. You just go ahead and shoot because you know that later on in editing, you have enough degree of freedom to adjust the image quite a bit. But in the cell phone's case, you have to keep in mind that you don't have so much degree of freedom. So you better get everything right when you click the, click the shutter button. So again, a lot of the editing apps uh, what they do is they know this limitation. So funny enough, what they do is they hallucinate information. So for example, if you have a picture and you're not smiling, the, the AI can actually open your mouth and make you smile. They, they actually hallucinate teeth and everything inside. So, so there is that end of the spectrum where you can do whatever you want. Once, once you start hallucinating, there is no limit to it. But uh, without going there, the, the, the range is very small in the case of smartphones. How important is it to do white balance before shoot, before shooting or to do it in post-processing? Uh, in the case of a smartphone, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, white balance is a software thing. There is no hardware changes that, it, that happens that actually changes your result. So even if you made a mistake in white balance during capture, you can always go and adjust it post-capture. Uh, post so, uh, if you did it before, you get a small advantage, but not so much. So you can always go back. So all of these images, I can I can go from one to the other without losing too much information. Do you have any suggestions of a camera app with pro settings, but not fully manual? Actually, many of these pro settings also have a, a, a pro apps also have an auto auto mode built into them. So when you, when you get that app, in addition to allowing all manual settings, that also allows you to capture in uh, somewhat uh, fully automatic mode. But having said that, they use a slightly different pipeline uh, in comparison to what uh, a native app does. So the, uh, for example, Android and many of those uh, uh, phones like uh, iPhone, their native app has certain algorithms which beautifies your image or does certain nice things because they know their hardware more than anybody else who writes the app because the app writers are outside of Apple or outside of Google, for example. Um, but uh, you, you have to do your own thing and look what you're looking for. The best thing to do is try free free software, free apps. You know, there is uh, probably many of them that uh, many of them even support demo mode or in-app purchases. It's good to experiment. Can we access these wide Intelli modes with our phones or were you talking about how far the subject is away from the camera? Oh, you mean how to get the depth? I think so. Yeah, but... so uh, let me see. So depending on the manufacturer uh, and uh, which phone you buy, if you have access to their SDK, some of the phones actually provide uh, uh, depth yeah, as a part of their API, you, you have to be a programmer to, to actually be able to write an app and access it. But there may be some apps out there which already make use of this and report you know, how far the subject is, but I'm not totally sure about, sure about that. One thing to see is there is something called AR, augmented reality uh, to uh, apps, 
where you can hold the phone and measure distances between objects. You can maybe get that for uh, get such an app and actually use it as a way to deduce how far things are from you. About the phone's um, built-in bias, is there a way to change that bias globally so you don't have to keep adjusting the exposure? Um, that's, that's actually a good question. So the way it works in iPhone is when I change the bias, and then if I move the phone, the bias is lost because the composition is different, you know, I'm looking at a different scene. So there is something called exposure locking. So you have to change the bias by pressing hard and pushing up and pressing it again, holding it firm on an, in the case of iPhone, where it locks that exposure until you press some other button or something happens. So that's usually called exposure locking or the focus locking. So everything is stuck, stuck there from that point. But on the other hand, if you use one of these manual raw capture apps, there you can actually control the lens position uh, where, where it is focused. Oh, by the way, that's another way to get the distance. You can use one of these raw capture apps where you can move the lens and you can know for what position, what object is in focus. So that's another way to get, get the depth and distance. Any thoughts if smartphones or on tripods will ever be able to do simple astrophotography or a nice reddish moon? So Google uh, actually claims that they have an astro mode and uh, the way it works is uh, in, in traditionally DSLRs, what they do is they expose the actual sensor for like 30 seconds, 20 seconds uh, to get uh, you know, sufficiently enough photons at the same time, not actually allowing the stars to move and create rails. But in the cell phone, the way it works is the maximum exposure time of a sensor is usually limited. Uh, in some cases, it can be half a second or a second. So what they do is they take a bunch of, keep taking bunch of images and they slap them all together to make one. So if you put it on tripod, it would greatly help ease the, the burden on the phone to register all these images. If you hold it by hand, what it does is it has an internal inertial measurement unit, IMU, the same in aircraft, what you use to measure the rotations. It uses, us to it uses it to figure out how you have moved your hand and then actually registers all the images based on image content and IMU. It's a lot of calculation and it can make a lot of error there. But if you put it on the tripod, all of those things become unnecessary and you probably will get much sharper image. How, how can you take star trail photos with an iPhone? Uh, I think you probably will need some sort of an app to do it. So Star Trek uh, pictures, for example, it probably goes uh, a certain length. You have to mount it on the phone and keep on taking images uh, over and over again. Uh, it's recommended not to do it manually because when you touch the phone, you probably move the phone and you, you ruin the image. So there are apps that allow you to keep on taking those images in a time-lapse manner and composite and create that final final outcome. But, uh, but I, uh, you know, I haven't uh, explored that area myself, so I'm not 100% sure, but technically it's possible. Your Zoom video image is interesting. What are you using for a webcam and lighting? Oh, I'm actually using uh, a DSLR and I'm uh, sitting slightly outdoor-ish uh, with a lot of windows, so I get a nice uniform light. So I'm using a DSLR, so it's able to let me see myself a little bit. So it is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a 5D Mark IV. Is it working? Okay, there we go. So I can, it's a manual focus lens. Uh, as I can change the focus, I have to manually adjust it. Uh, but if I had out of focus lens, it would have worked uh, equally well. So I'm using a very large lens, uh, something like this. So what it is doing is it's creating a real bokeh behind me, not an artificial bokeh that uh, Zoom creates. So the one that Zoom creates kind of, uh, you know, makes my uh, makes people's head kind of uh, always uh, have this artifact and it keeps flickering and whatnot. Uh, I, I just happen to have it because I do uh, photography and I kind of uh, double use it as a webcam. But it's, uh, if you just want to use it as a webcam, it, uh, it's pretty expensive to invest on in that direction. And regarding the lighting, what is the recommended light temperature for doing Zoom calls using a cell phone camera in artificially lit rooms uh, oh, okay. during the night? That is a good question. So don't buy tungsten color. So usually 20, okay, I have a good answer for it. So RGB, the sensor set uh, the cell phone uses, it has RGB pixels. And B, 
the pixel b the colored b uh, pixels are the most uh, are the least sensitive pixels so if you don't have enough b in your light or the blue content your images are going to be very noisy so the light that has very less blue is the warm light which is like which looks kind of oranges tungsten like the halogen bulbs and all these leds which create this evening light warm light that will be not good on the other hand if you use cool white light you know which looks more whitish uh, that has a lot of blue content and helps increase the snr uh, of the signal that's actually coming in you know the actual signal content itself is higher in blue so that helps to make your images look uh, crisp and nice and less noisy second thing to keep in mind is that uh, blue traditionally keeps you more awake and warm light kind of gives you doziness or sleepy sensation uh so if you are in a zoom call and if you want people to be alert i think it's good to use blue light that's a that's a side thing uh does external flash work with cell phone flash come again sorry does external flash work with a cell phone flash what's the what's that uh, what's the word i didn't catch it In, internal flash uh does it, it does in external flash oh okay with, yeah so external flashes for cell phones are usually just a bunch of led lights so what they do is they turn it on and then they take a picture and then they go off the problem is the synchronization so by the time you it sends a signal to the the, the light and you turn on the light and turn it off so it's very hard to synchronize because it goes through a layer of apis and stacks in software before the signal can go to the device through bluetooth or whatever so because of that very low sync speed what they do is they turn on the light for a longer period before you even take the picture the light goes on and you take a picture and then the light goes off other older traditional flash which is the camera flash is not usually not led it's based on something called the xenon arc where a high voltage creates an arc of light so that those usually last for few milliseconds you know they're very nice spectrally rich light but the problem is they only last for a very small amount of time and that the, the cell phone does not have as of today does not have enough capability to, to synchronize with that light so short answer is if you are using uh, an actual traditional camera flash xenon flash you cannot but if you are using an external led which are made for cell phones you you can i guess you have to buy it. it it's not something so commonly available you have to go look for it uh which phone apps work properly with deep fusion on an iphone and will there ever be a way to adjust the deep fusion parameters oh that's actually yeah uh, i mean uh, i don't know uh, short answer is it's a little bit more in depth of a question and deep fusion usually refers to merging all those frames in some intelligent manner and producing an output and it's hard for me to speak uh, you know what what the road map what happens there and how things go there but uh, the one of the problem with deep fusion or any of these algorithms for any company like android is that the more you open up the more the chances that people will mess with it and screw it up so uh, uh, and also it it just makes the whole device look in bad light so what people generally do is is keep those algorithms closed and give you access to the final result or maybe some a uh, uh, range of final results where you can have enough degree to tweak it and make it better so uh, yeah i don't know so the short answer is it depends on the company and the gear and motion would you comment on incandescent versus led lighting for web video calls yeah as i said uh, incandescent lights uh, usually the filament bulbs uh, they have a spectrum like this uh, let me quickly show you what uh, what i mean uh there you go so this remember i talked about this orange sky incandescent light or halogen bulbs have spectrum like this uh, in, in, more close enough no, not exactly but just to give an example so what you see here is the blue content this is actually 380 to 450 is a visible blue and it doesn't have much blue so what happens is that uh, it gets so little blue so you are putting very little blue on the face uh, or when you are uh, video conferencing and the camera has to boost up the blue so much to make up for very little signal that the whole entire image becomes very noisy every time you boost a signal you are adding uh, reducing the signal to noise ratio so it is actually not very recommended but having said that it also depends on the app 
So some uh, apps, what they do, cameras or the webcam, they try to balance the image. That's when things get screwed up. If they didn't balance the image and leave it the way it is. Uh, so what I mean is uh, I showed this image. Uh, if you have an incandescent light, you get an image, don't convert it into a cool image. If you leave it the way it is, you're okay. But uh, most often they try to change it into cool, 90% uh, of the times. So you run into low noise uh, uh, issues. And are there any interesting IP advantages or distinctions among smartphone manufacturers? Uh, it is a very contested space, a uh, very tight space. Uh, many a times, uh, uh, it's hard to comment. Many a times uh, I feel people bulldoze through. Big companies have a lot of muscles. They just bulldoze through. Uh, and the, the, sometimes the philosophy is, Oh, let me release it when somebody disputes, I'll, I'll come to it and fight the case. That, that sort of is one, one side of the coin. Second side of the coin is uh, they, uh, whether the infringement can be detected from the outside. That's another thing. Many things are hidden inside. And another thing to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, a lot of the things that people do is sort of, uh, you know, there is one way or another way to go around the IP. You, you know, that's not a, generally not a road blocker. There is a way to go around. Uh, you know, you do use a different algorithm, different technique, different type of sensing. And a lot of this photography stuff is anyway old, uh, you know, there isn't any fundamentally new. I, that was, that was all the questions, uh, Manohar. Um, thank you so much for presenting today. It was extremely informative. I, I certainly learned a lot. Cool. Thank you. It was a pleasure giving this presentation. Yeah. Oh, thank you, way, everyone. Looking, yeah. Yeah, looking forward to that photo uh, exercise or uh, appreciation and hopefully people will participate. Yes. Okay. Oh, bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah, bye, everyone.